Hello everyone and welcome to another mini sky tonight. So a topic I wanted to cover over today is to kind of explain the different types of eclipses, a lunar eclipse and a solar eclipse. Those two terms are often in exchange with one another. So I wanted to go over some of the details of how we get an eclipse, the difference between the two, and to kind of give you a heads up of when the next eclipse might occur. So let's dive into it. So let's look at some of the basic facts. Let's take a look at the two components that are usually involved with an eclipse. The first one is the sun. Our sun is incredibly huge. Even though it's an average sized star, it's really big. In fact, our sun is so big that 1.3 million Earths could fit inside the sun. It's huge, but since it's so far away, it looks relatively small in our sky. In fact, it's 400 times farther away than the moon is from the earth. So it kind of looks roughly about a half a degree in the sky. And the reason being why we measure in degrees when it comes to looking up at the sky is because sizes vary tremendously depending upon how far away they are. So in astronomy, when we look at something in the sky, we don't measure by how long it is in the sky, we measure by its angular size. The next component is the moon. Our moon is roughly about one fourth the size of the earth. So it's like comparing a baseball to a basketball. So our, we got a decent sized moon, but compared to the sun, it's incredibly small. In fact, here it's just a rough, it's not a distance scale, it's a rough size scale, just to show you how tiny the Earth and the Moon and the Sun are compared to each other. So our Moon and Earth is extremely tiny compared to our large star, the Sun. But because of the, their distances and their relative sizes, it works out to where they're both a half a degree in the sky. They look roughly about the same size. So here's an image of the moon and the sun in the same view. And yes, you can see the moon in the day. Many people believe, oh, you only see the moon at night, when in actuality, you can see the moon in different times, depending upon where it is in its orbit. So it is possible to see a new moon, but it's really, really, really hard to do so. But you can definitely see the moon when it's in its crescent phases close to the sun, as you can see in this image here. That little dot right above there, that little bright star is actually the planet Venus. So how do we get the different phases of the moon? Many people think, and it's a common misconception that we get the phases of the moon is because, oh, the earth shadow goes on to the moon or there's a physical dark side and a light side of the moon. In actuality, that's not the case. Just to show you kind of the images over here, the image to the left is the near side, the side that we can see from the Earth, and the other picture is the far side of the moon. So as you can see, the far side is much lighter in terms of its physical appearance than the near side of the moon. So I'm sorry, Pink Floyd fans, there is no such thing as a dark side of the moon. All sides of the moon eventually receive light. And here's how. The moon is what is known to be in a synchronous orbit, or it's tidally locked, meaning one side of the moon always faces the Earth. So it rotates at the same rate it revolves, meaning that as it goes around the Earth, it slightly turns to where always one side faces the Earth. And that's the side that we see, the beautiful faces of the moon, like the man in the moon or the woman in the moon. So those dark areas that you see on the surface. In fact, those dark areas are what are called maria, which is term, the, a Latin term for seas, because the ancient mariners thought, oh, there's oceans on the moon. So as you can see in the diagram below, this is how we get the phases of the moon. It's based upon where the moon is in its orbit and its relative position to the sun. When it's the moon is close to the sun, the shadow of the moon, the shadow from the light shining on to the moon is covered the, by the near side. So think of it kind of like you and your friend are standing next to a fire. 
like a campfire. It's getting close to October and we're getting to enjoy the beautiful autumn sky. And you wanna enjoy a nice campfire out in the autumn breeze. And you and your friend are sitting right next to the fire. And if your friend stands in front of you, you see their dark, you see the shadow of them as because they're in front of you. If they're to the right or the left of you, you see half of them illuminated by the campfire, but their backside is still dark. And then when they're behind you, you see them completely illuminated by the campfire, but you don't see their backside. The same thing goes with the moon. And a good way to test for this is like, just take a, like a tennis ball and have like a bright light shine and then rotate the moon around this bright light. And you'll see the different faces of the moon. So why don't we have an eclipse every month? Because the moon should go behind the earth. We should have a lunar eclipse and it goes in front of us. So should we should have a solar eclipse, right? Well, it has to deal with the tilt of the moon's plane. The moon is tilted five degrees above the equatorial plane or the plane that all the planets go around the sun on. Because of this five degree tilt, as you can see the relative distance and size down below, sometimes the Earth's shadow can cross the moon, sometimes it can't. It's only when the path of the moon crosses the ecliptic plane. And when it crosses the ecliptic plane in such a way that the sun and Earth and moon are in alignment. So it happens not very often. It takes a lot of precise timing to get it to where they all are in alignment. So that's why we don't have an eclipse every month. So what are the different types of eclipses? The first one is in a solar eclipse. The best way to remember like what eclipse it is, think about what's being covered. In a solar eclipse, our view in the sky, it looks like the sun is being covered up by the moon. So that's called a solar eclipse. So that's where you have the sun, the moon, and the earth are in alignment. And the moon casts a shadow on the earth. A lunar eclipse is where you have the sun, the earth, and then the moon. And the moon is being eclipsed by the earth's shadow. So that's why it's called a lunar eclipse. So here's a unique gif of a solar eclipse. As you can see, the shadow of the moon going on the earth is relatively tiny. So you have to be in just the right place in order to see a solar eclipse. Whereas in for a lunar eclipse, as you can see in this diagram here, a good portion of the earth that's in the nighttime side will get to see the lunar eclipse. Whereas in the solar eclipse, there is a specific place and time to where the moon's shadow crosses the earth. So let's look at the different types of eclipses. A partial eclipse occurs when part of the sun of the moon is covered. It kind of looks like a bite is taken out of it. So as you can see to the image of the left, that's a partial solar eclipse. And we got to see one here in San Antonio a few years ago. The next type of an eclipse is an annular eclipse. This kind of only applies to solar eclipses. An annular eclipse deals with where the moon doesn't completely cover the sun. And it kind of leaves this ring around it or the proper term an annulus, hence why an annular eclipse. So what causes an annular eclipse? Well, not only is the moon's orbit tilted, it's slightly elongated. And since it has, or in the technical term, it has a high eccentricity, meaning it's kind of like very oval. Since it has a unique eccentricity or an oval shape, it looks like sometimes it's close to the sun, sometimes it looks like it's farther away from the sun. And it's it, during those times where it looks like it's farther away from the sun, that's when we start to get an annular eclipse because it's far enough away from the earth to where the moon isn't completely covering up the sun. It's like basically taking your fist and completely covering up a light and then moving the fist closer to the light and it looks like, oh, the, you haven't completely covered it. Same idea. 
So when it comes to an annular eclipse, the image over here towards the right, when you're looking at the red dot, to the, the circular or the oval path with the red dot closest to the sun, that's kind of where you get an annular eclipse. Whereas its, its counterpart over here towards the far right, if the red dot was close to the earth and in between the sun and the earth, that's when you start to get a total eclipse. Now let's go to the moon. The moon has something similar, but not quite. A penumbral eclipse of the moon is when the moon goes into the lighter part of the Earth's shadow and appears slightly darker. It's not a total lunar eclipse, but it's kind of a shade darker. So how does that happen? Now keep in mind, the sun is huge. So the light, since it's so big, not only goes straight, it comes from the top and goes down and goes from the bottom up and it em emits out in all directions. And since it, it can emit out in all directions, it creates a fine point at the back of the earth. Since you have the light from the bottom of the sun going up and light from the top of the sun going down and going straight across it. And the only areas that aren't covered by the sun is a pinpoint or this cone shape back behind the Earth, kind of like this. If the moon's orbit just happens to land in a place to where it's not in this triangular cone near the back, that's where you get a penumbral eclipse. And a partial eclipse is where it's partly in the penumbra and partly in the umbra or the darkest part of the Earth's shadow. And when the moon is in the darkest part, that's when you get a total lunar eclipse. And of course, total eclipses is when the moon is completely covered by the Earth's shadow for a total lunar eclipse. And a total solar eclipse is when the sun is completely covered by the moon. So here's kind of a map of some of the total and annular eclipses of the sun that you can take a look at to see which one's coming close to you. For us here in San Antonio, the next total solar eclipse is going to happen in April of 2024. So mark your calendars. In fact, if you wanna get a good Christmas gift for your family, consider getting solar eclipse glasses on December of 2023. So that's something to kind of mark in your calendars because come the total solar eclipse of 2024, it's gonna get much harder to be able to find those glasses. So here are some of the lunar eclipses that you can see. The reason being why they don't have a map per se, because as I explained at the beginning of this video, lunar eclipses get to be seen over a wide area because they're covered by the Earth's shadow. So a lot of people in the darker nighttime positions of the Earth's shadow get to see the lunar eclipse. So for here in the United States, come Thanksgiving time around about 2020, we'll get to see a penumbral eclipse. So you'll see the moon start to get slightly darker. And there is one coming up in 2021 in May, but we'll get to see near the end of it because it'll start to rise, the moon will start to rise as it's finishing out its eclipse for us. Oh well. In fact, the next total lunar eclipse that we will get to see it's in its entirety is not till 2025. So here are a few dates if you want to check out some of the next types of lunar eclipses. So lunar eclipses, you don't have to do any type of particular details. You go out and you look at them and they're a beautiful sight to behold. But solar eclipses, you have to do a little more preparation. So here are some of the cool things you can do during a solar eclipse. So when the moon is eclipsing the sun and everything is dark, you'll notice that some stars and even a few planets will start to be visible. Also something fun to do, check out some of what animals are doing. Animals behave differently during a solar eclipse because they're so used to the circadian rhythm that when all of a sudden it gets disruptive, it kind of throws them off a bit. So when you go towards a total solar eclipse, here are some of the things that you need to bring. You need some sunglasses just for the day, but don't use sunglasses to look at the total solar eclipse. You need solar glasses. 
but have some sunglasses for when you're not looking at those total solar eclipse. You'll need a hat, you'll need some sunscreen because even though the sun is going to be eclipsed, you still need to protect yourself because some of the sun's radiation is still coming towards the earth. Bring a picnic blanket or a chair to sit on in a nice open area. You want to have water because you want, don't want to get dehydrated and maybe a few snacks, but just obviously make sure to clean up after yourself. So here are the things that you can use to observe a solar eclipse. Some good quality solar eclipse glasses. And make sure that there's no, like, no dings or anything and they're not some offshoot brand they, that they do come from a legitimate source. You can use a telescope with solar filters. So chances are if a person has a telescope set up and they have a solar filter, they have a good solar filter. And you can look for online what a good solar filter is from reputable sources for your particular telescope. Also something to consider looking into if you're trying to go on the cheap end is a pinhole telescope, where basically you take a sheet of paper and create a nice little hole in it, and then you put another sheet of paper down on the ground. And you line the papers up to where you can see the sun through the pinhole and you get to see the solar eclipse happen through that little pinhole. So here's how to properly use eclipse glasses and to check for them. First off, make sure that your glasses don't have any defects, like there's no scratches, there's no damage to them, that the uh, film inside them is not flimsy and can fall out, and or it has visible lines through it. Before you look up at the solar eclipse, sit down with your body facing towards the sun, but do not look at the sun quite yet. Close your eyes and tilt your face towards the sun to where you can feel the warmth of the sun's rays. And then gently put on the glasses. And then open your eyes and then gently look around until you can see the sun. You'll basically see kind of like this orange circle as it's starting to get eclipsed. And then of course, when you're removing your glasses, Close your eyes, look down at the ground, take them off. And of course, don't move around while you're wearing the solar glasses because you may not be able to see through them. I can't count you the number of times I've pe seen people trip over themselves. And be sure to inspect your glasses before looking at the sun because you don't want to damage your eyes. Do not use these. I can't count to you the number of people that said, well, what if I can use this? Or if yeah, what if I can use this? And I wanted to point this out because it's so important to protect your eyes. So the first one is sunglasses. You cannot use regular sunglasses that you can either get from an eye doctor or just off the shelf from your everyday store. These do not work. So do not use these. They can be used for looking at stuff during the day when you're not looking directly at the sun, but you cannot look directly at the sun with these. I've asked people, can they use color film? Don't use color film because eventually it starts to bleed through, the light starts to bleed through and eventually the color film starts to, to evaporate over time. I've even somebody asked me, can they use floppy disks? And no, don't use floppy disks. If you don't know what they are, don't use them. Don't go looking for them. In fact, there's one of the, they're the, one of the few things from the past that I'm kind of glad that they're slowly starting to disappear. Um, smoked glass, because again, there's no polarization or filter on the smoked glass. Same thing with medical x-rays. I was kind of surprised when somebody asked me, hey, I, I work in a medical office. Can we use medical x-rays to do it? No. Also, welder's glass is below number 14 rating. This was one I had to do some research on because I had a person who was into architecture and he does a lot of welding for some of his projects and he asked hey I use some of these huge welding goggles and I was just curious if they could be used and I know for welding goggles they have a very good high rating to be able to shield your eyes from the bright blinding lights of welding so after doing some research if they are above a number 14 grading go for it if you have them but if you don't, don't go looking for them. Because I, if I recall correctly from what I could see from different ratings and stuff, the good quality welder's glasses that are above a 14 rating are really expensive. It's cheaper to get the solar glasses. 
So why is it so important to tell you don't look at the sun directly or to use these bad examples of looking at the sun? Well, here's why. Now, I, it may be a little bit scary for some of you, but I wanted to bring this point home because often when I've had students in my classes, they're like, yeah, 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 just another rule I got to follow, whoop de doo Well, I find it more engaging when a student gets to see why it's so important. Not a, oh yeah, yeah, this is just another rule I'm gonna have to follow. But when they actually see the damages that can be done, it kind of strikes a little closer to home for them. And they're like, okay, yeah, I won't do it, but I now I know why. So here's the reason why you don't look directly at the sun. In your eye, you have a natural lens. So you have kind of like a miniature telescope inside your eye. And this lens in your eye focuses the light back down to a point towards the back of your eye or towards the retina. And the retina is what takes the light from your eye that's going in and processes it and sends it up to the optical nerve to where your brain can process it. So it's crucial that this natural process works very well, that the light comes in, the retina receives the information, and then it goes back up into your brain. The problem is, is that if the retina receives too much light, it starts receiving damage. And here's why. Again, the lens, when the light is focused to a point and there's so much light, it becomes intense and it starts to heat up. Like if you're out camping and you're trying to create a fire and you can't do the two sticks method, May I suggest having a nice little lens and then focusing that lens to a point on some leaves to start the kindling. Whereas in, that's kind of what's happening in your eye too. So that's something to keep in mind. So when you're looking at the sun, the intense light from the sun is focusing that intense light back to a point. And this is where it kind of gets a little bit creepy and grotesque. The image to the left is a natural eye undamaged, it looks good. The image to the right, however, has received severe sun damage. And there, and this is an eye that possibly can no longer see. Yeah, that's what's happening inside your eye when you stare at the sun. And I don't want that to happen to anybody. You have amazing eyes and I want you to be able to keep your eyesight as long as possible so you can enjoy the wonders of our world and to explore our universe. So here's some dates that you can look towards to be able to mark your calendars to see when the next eclipse is. So in coming up, Shortly after Thanksgiving, on November 29th of 2020, we'll get to see a penumbral eclipse here. It'll slightly look darker, kind of like it looks like a the like haze has gone across the moon, but at least we get to see a bit of an eclipse. On April 8th of 2024, here in San Antonio, you get to see a total solar eclipse. And no, I cannot change these dates. This is when they're going to occur. A well, lunar eclipse is going to happen in May of 2025. So here's some things that you can mark your calendars for. If you have any questions or comments, leave it down in the comments below. If, you, if there's a topic you would love for me to cover over, leave it down in the comments as well. Also, parents, if you're looking for some fun activities for your kids, I recommend futurereadysa.org. It's a fun platform that allows your kids to do some fun activities and earn badges. So it basically gamifies learning. I highly recommend the Astronomy Plus mission because it's one that I've worked on. In fact, I'll leave a link in the description below for it. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and as always, never stop learning.